First Epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 16. Then on the other hand, pick up Genesis 3, 6. Genesis 3, 6. Now this morning we're going to talk about temptation. Last night we talked about how to get in fellowship with God, get forgiven, get things right. And now we're going to talk this morning about what to do now that you are right and how to keep from messing up again. All right, now you take 1 John chapter 2 and look at verse 16. And notice that there that uh, the apostle John is warning the Christian about three things. And he calls those things the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. See those three things? Now, uh, three items there. Everything the devil is going to try to mess you up on is going to be one of those three items. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. And notice from the beginning of that Bible to the end of that Bible, those temptations never change. The original temptation had those three elements in it. You look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, and that woman looked at that tree. There were three things about that tree. Three things. And those three things matched the three things you just read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. All right, now take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, beginning at the first verse, we're going to talk about the temptation of the greatest overcomer of sin that ever lived, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, sinless, and yet tempted. The Bible says, tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. All right, now get Matthew chapter 4, and begin at verse 1, start down through there. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And coming in verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 down there, you're reading about the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read about the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're reading those same three items again. Now, they, they're worded different, but they're the same three items. And basically, every temptation you'll have will be one of those three temptations. Uh, everybody's going to be tempted. There's no sin to be tempted. The sin comes in yielding. Like old Mark Twain said, who was a practical atheist and a skeptic, a great humorist, but just as lost as a Madison Avenue executive in Oakey and Oakey Swamp. And you take Mark Twain, he said, I can resist anything but temptation. Martin Luther said, my temptations have been the masters of my divinity. There isn't anybody who ever lived that wasn't tempted. Jesus Christ was tempted. Matthew 4, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Tempted three times. The three times he was tempted, he was tempted exactly like you're going to be tempted. And we're going to talk about those temptations. Uh, the Bible said Abraham was, uh, the Lord tempted Abraham and said, Get up there and offer up your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. The Bible says God doesn't tempt any man, neither is God tempted. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed and so forth and so on. And when God tempted Abraham, it wasn't a temptation to sin, it was a testing. And we're told that in Hebrews chapter 11, when Abraham was tried, he offered up his only son. Uh, folks say, well, God can't be tempted, but the devil tempted Christ. Yeah, but that was God in the flesh. The statement in James chapter 1, not on God in the flesh. Talking about God as a spirit. They that worship him, see, you've got to get it right. All right, so the Lord's up there in Matthew chapter 4, and the devil comes down and tempts him three times, and when he tempts him, he tempts him just like you're going to be tempted. And like I say, you're going to be tempted. No way in the world you can avoid it. There are more temptations uh, today abroad than ever have been. Like I said last night, I don't envy you young people. You've got a tough road to hoe, and I'm glad I don't have to hoe it. I'm glad mine's already hoed. Uh, you're tempted in every side. No way you can beat it. Boy, you go into a spa and they got nudes all over the wall. You pick up a morning newspaper, lesbians all over the next movie. The Valley of the Dolls, beyond the mountain of the river of the dolls, the dolls, you know, all that mess. You know, call me curious, yellow. They never could tell it like it was. Why don't they just put up, they say, come see a good pornographic movie about perversion and fornication. Why don't they advertise it like that? You know why they don't advertise it like that? Because they're hypocrites. You talk about hypocrites in the church, the biggest hypocrites you ever met in your life are theater owners and advertisers. X-rated movie. Now they call them PG. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Pornographically gross. <laughs> yeah. 
Rated R, rated R, Rocky. <laughs> you know that kind of business. Uh, you know, speaking of gross, I'm going to divert in just a minute, but speaking of gross, the grossest thing I ever seen in my life was done by a bunch of teenage girls. <laughs> we had a we had a camp up in Canton, Ohio, and they're having a sketch, you know, and they were they were illustrating words, and the teenage girl was supposed to illustrate the word gross. And I'm telling you, they got up there about 14, 15, 16 year old, five of them. And they had a glass of water with a toothbrush. And the first one dipped that thing in that water and brushed her teeth and spit it back in the glass and had the one next to her. <laughs> and she brushed her teeth and handed the next one. And the last one drank it. I'm telling you, man, there were people leaving that building, man. I mean, just green. <laughs> Boy, I got a strong stomach, but not that strong, man. I mean, I can eat, literally, I can eat chew garlic and onions and then eat a jalapeno pepper and drink vinegar. I can drink vinegar with ice cubes in it, you know. I got a good, strong stomach, but not that, man. My stars. Whew. Boy. Boy, handling a dead body ain't any worse than that. And so they say PG, you know, and RX. They never could tell it like it was. Now you're going to be tempted in every side, and the temptation's going to get worse and worse. The age is getting looser and looser. I got a sign in the back of my car that says, Back to the Bible or Back to the Jungle. And I tell you, that's how it's going to be with this country. We're going to get back to the book, or we're going to wind up in the jungle. And you're going to be tempted. And listen, if you're a child of God, you're going to be tempted more than unsaved people are tempted. Years ago, when they had the slaves down in the south, uh, uh, the master and the slave were discussing things one afternoon. The slave was a Christian, the master wasn't. And the master said to the slave, he said, uh, How come you're always praying all the time and always crying out to God? He says, Because I was tempted, boss. I was tempted. And the boss man said, Well, the devil don't ever tempt me. And the colored man said, you know why the devil don't tempt you? And he said, no, why? And the colored man said, well, boss, when we goes out duck hunting and the ducks fall in the water, he said, does the dog go after the crippled duck or the live duck? And the master said, well, he goes after the crippled duck. And the colored man said, that's why the devil don't fool you, boss, because you's a dead duck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right. I tell you, you don't, the devil don't really start pouring on you till you get saved. Then when you get saved, the trouble comes. Listen, young fella, being saved won't solve all your problems. It'll get you out of hell. Anything beats going to hell. But I'll tell you, it won't solve all your problems. Some you're going to have to solve for yourself. Some you're going to have to fight out. And I'm going to talk about that. We're going to talk today about temptation. All right there in Matthew chapter 4, read down there through verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, after these things, Jesus was led by the Spirit, led up in the wilderness to be tempted. Other place said he was for the wild beast, forty days and forty nights, being tempted of the devil. And the tempter came to him. And the devil says to him, If, if, have you ever noticed every time that Satan speaks in the Bible, he speaks with a question mark? He spoke to Eve back there and he said, uh, to her he said, uh, Yea, hath God said. When he came around uh, to speak to Job, he said, uh, uh, first to Job's wife, he said, tell him to curse God and die. Then he went back up to glory and he said to God about Job, he said, doth Job fear God for naught? Question mark. When he comes to Christ, the Mount of Temptation, he says to Christ, he said, if you're the Son of God, turn these rocks into bread. You know what the first temptation is? It has to do with food. The Bible said back there in Genesis 3 that Eve saw that uh, tree was good for food. You know what this matches in the first John chapter two? The lust of the flesh. The flesh wants to live. The flesh wants to enjoy itself. Oh that Ishmael might live before thee. And so when the devil tempts the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing he tempts him on is clear. He tempts him on the lust of the flesh. Food. And he says, If thou be the Son of God, turn these rocks into bread. And then Jesus answers him and says, and it's very important to notice how he answers. He answers and says, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. You come down to those pastors and notice that, every, notice that every time the Lord Jesus Christ answers the devil, he says, it is written, it is written, it is written. 
And that brings me to say something that you're not going to want to hear. I'm sorry it's true for some of you, but it's true. There's no such thing as victory over the devil without knowing that book and knowing what that book says. Isn't that it? Just forget it. You want to live a life for God? You don't want to spend time in your book? Just forget it. You ain't going to do it. There's any way in the world you can overcome the power of darkness without knowing that book. Christ said, it is written, quote, it is written, quote, it is written, quote. Paul says over there in Ephesians, he said, take the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is, Paul says, the Word of God. Our young people today don't spend any time memorizing Scripture, don't know the Scripture. If I were to ask some of you young people to stand up right now and give me four verses on sports, you couldn't do it for love and the money. But you like sports, don't you? How come you don't know what God says about it? If I ask you to stand up right now and give me some verses on what the Bible says about money or raising children, you couldn't do it. But some of you like money, and some of you raising children are going to raise children. How come you don't know what God says about it? How come a born-again, saved child of God who is saved by receiving with meekness the incorruptible word which is able to save his soul, the word of God that liveth and abideth forever, how come you don't know it? Why, reason why, one reason why, the other reason, we have, one reason why we have such a low grade of Christianity today is because the saved people who are born again are not going by the book God gave them for them to go by. When those fellows play pro football, they got an umpire, they got a referee out there, and that bird goes by the book. When those fellows play down that stadium in Cincinnati and knock that ball around, that referee and those umpires go by the book. You don't play the game of life without going by the book. Now, how are you going to play it right if you don't know what the book? You don't even know the rules. Christ said it is written, it is written. Now, when the devil comes to you and tempts you, how do you know how to handle him? How do you know how to answer him if you don't know the book? Christ said it is written, it is written. I have young people come to me all the time in Christian camps and say, well, Brother Ruffman, I used to live for the Lord and so forth and so on, this and that and other thing, but I did this and that and I'm in trouble now and I messed up here and messed up there and... What am I going to do about it? And I've confessed my sin. I've judged it. And I'm right with the Lord now, but I'm afraid the next couple of weeks I won't be. I say, get in the book. Get in the book. Get in the book. Kid, get in the book. A lot of them don't. Boy, I bet you if you had a dollar for every time you read a chapter in the Bible in the last year, you'd be hurting for money, some of you. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how long that old book can lie around the shelf and never look at it? The first temptation is, do it yourself. That's the first temptation. If you're the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. The first temptation is, do it yourself. Don't pray about it. You're a self-made man. Do it yourself. A guy said, I'm a self-made man. Another man said, that relieves the Lord of a great responsibility. A man said, I'm a self-made man. Another fellow said, that's a perfect example of unskilled labor. A guy said, I'm a self-made man. But if I had to do it over again, I'd call on somebody else to do the job. <laughs> now, the first temptation is do it yourself. Can you play a musical instrument? Don't pray about it. Just do it without God. Can you sing? Don't pray about it. Just sing without God. Can you draw? Never mind asking the Lord. Just do it yourself. That's the first temptation. You going to live your life? Just you live it. <laughs> Don't drag God in. You do it. Do it yourself. You know, they say when the guys begin to learn how to draw or, or play an instrument, they say, be yourself, be yourself. No, you better learn how to do it before you be yourself. And that's the big thing wrong with modern art. they got a bunch of folks that are being themselves, and not enough of them there, so when they're themselves, it's worth looking at. <laughs> what you better do is learn the fundamentals and learn the technique before you learn how to be yourself. You better let God do something for you. You know why most people go to hell, if not all of them? They're trying to do it themselves. The first temptation is do it yourself. Fix it yourself. Do your own repair work. Instant ready-made. Just buy these kits, you know, at the Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward and Kmart and Woolco. That's where I shop, Kmart and Woolco. And you ever go to those places, you know, and they buy this do-it-yourself kit? Those things never work. They never work. I just, I just quit fooling them. I'm like, I like a guy that had to fix a cuckoo clock. When he got the thing fixed, the cuckoo came out backwards and said, What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? <laughs> I, I don't know nothing about machinery. And when it comes to automobiles, I'm as dumb as any woman you ever met in your life. 
I tell you, it comes automobiles, I'm just like a woman. I figure a car to run, and if it don't run, sell it. <laughs> I mean, if I'm driving a car and it stops, I'll sell it. I don't know what's wrong with it. I ain't going to find out either. I can't find out. I'll go up and open the hood, you know, and there's the trouble. That motor. <laughs> That's all I know about it. I know you're supposed to turn it and it's supposed to run. If it don't, you get rid of it. That's all I know about it. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. Self-made man. That kind of business. Are you going to enter the ministry? First temptation is do it yourself. Make your own plans. Don't consult God. You're going to get up and preach. Don't ask God what to preach. Don't ask him how to preach it. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. There's a cartoonist in this country named Carl Steele. And Carl Steele is a gospel cartoonist and does uh, not work exactly like I do, but he does cartoon for the Lord. And that old boy, when he was first got uh, saved and called to preach, uh, he uh, was tempted to do something that I'd never been tempted to do. Matter of fact, I was tempted just the opposite. When Carl Steele got saved and called to preach, he said, Lord, I don't want to preach, I want to paint. And the Lord said, give up your drawing board and give up your paints and give up your charcoal and give up your pastels and your oil colors and preach. And call forth the Lord on it a long time before he finally surrendered. And when he finally surrendered, the Lord said, okay, now go get your drawing board and draw for me. So he didn't get, the, he didn't have to throw it away. Now I was just the object. When I got saved, got called to preach, I was going to pitch the drawing board. I said, I want to preach. The Bible said it pleased God by the fools of preaching to save them that believe. I was going to go buy the book. And the Lord said, get your drawing board. I said, I don't want my drawing board. I'll preach it out my drawing board. Boy, you know how to wrestle with the Lord in that thing? And I'd, we'd have a street meeting, the guys would say, hey, Ruckman, did you bring your drawing board along? I said, no, too heavy, can't move it down. We'll go get it. <laughs> they go get it. And you know something? The Lord wouldn't let me get preaching that I was willing to bring the board along. Now, you know what that shows? That shows God will deal with, God won't deal with any two of you just exactly the same way. See? And your temptation may not be my temptation. But they have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Somebody's tempted with it. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Do you know that verse? Have you hid that word in your heart that you might not have sinned against him? You got any ammunition? And if the devil came to you right now and started pouring on you pretty hard, you, you able to fight? You able to defend yourself? You got this one? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You got this one? My God shall supply your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You got this one? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. You got this one? We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. You got this one? But thanks be to God that always calls to triumph through Jesus Christ. You got this one? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you, by much you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You got this one? No ten. You got any? You got any ammo? You loaded? You armed? Imagine a guy getting into the ring to fight for him in a Cassius Clay, one of those fellows, and stand there, you know, just stand there, no gloves, no training, nothing. Just stand there and say, well, what do I do now? <laughs> you get knocked out now. <laughs> hey, listen, when you get in the ring with the devil, you better be armed. You better be armed for bear. All right? The first temptation is do it yourself. Haven't you ever been ever, ever tempted to take matters into your own hands? How about the matters of vengeance? Did you ever have somebody give you a raw deal? Did you ever have somebody cost you $100,000? You ever have anybody cost you three or four thousand dollars? You ever have anybody at school take a girlfriend or boyfriend you thought was yours? You ever attempt to get even? You ever lie around at night and think what I'd do if I had that so and so where I could get a hold of them? <laughs> you know, Christians think about those things. You know that? I mean, good, saved, godly, dedicated, sweet, wonderful Christians <laughs> sit around the bed at night and think, now if I just got him over here, I could throw him over there and get him through there, and then I could stuff him down here. And, I mean. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't think that, would you? <laughs> and you know, some of that stuff starts going, you want to have something ready. You want to have vengeance as mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. See? You let the Lord do it. Uh, the first temptation is do it yourself. Don't do it yourself when it comes to vengeance. They have a classic story down south about a young man was in love with his neighbor's 
uh, daughter, a farm girl, he wanted to marry her, and the old man didn't care much for him. And that young man, to get vengeance on the father for not letting him marry his girl, planted a lot of his best crop lamb of Johnson grass. And about a year later, the farmer changed his mind and let, the, let his daughter marry the guy, and for a wedding present, he gave him about 40 acres of Johnson grass. <laughs> gave him the lamb the guy planted, see? So what you do when you take vengeance, see, you just cut your own throat for you through. The first temptation is do it yourself. And the way you fight that is call the Lord in on it. Call the Lord in on it. One time a little boy watched his dad make an anvil, or make a horseshoe in an anvil. And that old man got through making that horseshoe and went on about his business. That boy about 10 years old said, well, I can make one of them. And that boy got him out of anvil and that bellows and got that thing going. He made the wildest horseshoe you ever seen in your life. That thing looked like a pretzel. <laughs> And the old man came out and said, uh, I never saw a horse in my life, son, that could wear a shoe like that. He said, let's start over again and make one together. See? Now let's start over again, and this time, you and the Lord together, okay? This time, not you by your bold and brave self, fighting a lion. Your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking to devour. This time, you and the Lord, okay? Together. Together. That's the business. All right, that isn't all. The first temptation is do it yourself. Look at the next temptation. Come on down about two or three verses. And notice he says to the Lord Jesus Christ, cast yourself off the temple. He says, because it is written. Now look at the devil, quote scripture. It is written. He gave his angels charge over thee and they shall bear thee up. Isn't that in Matthew chapter 4? Now see the devil quote scripture there? Christ said, it is written, the devil says, it is written, you better know that book, you better know that book, the devil quote that book, the devil knows that power in that book, there might be some people who don't know the power in that book, but the devil knows the power in that book, and listen, when you use that sword in him, you know what he does, he just takes it out of your hand and use it right back, you better know the book, he said it is written, and then he misquotes Psalm 91, and the devil quotes that verse, he doesn't quote it like, like it's written. When the devil quotes that verse to Jesus, he doesn't give the thing like it is. He leaves out some very important words. For example, he leaves out in that passage, he leaves out, in all thy ways. And when he says, the angel shall bear thee up in thy hand, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone, the correct quotation said, in all thy ways, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Christ's ways at the first coming were not to make a spectacular coming down from outer space, like he will, to the temple, like he will, at Jerusalem, like he will. Christ's first coming was to come as a prophet and die on a cross. So the devil quotes the scripture, he leaves just enough out, see, to make it scriptural. You better know the book. Jerry or Campbellite get up and say, Baptism doth also now save us. And forget to tell you the verse began, the like figure, where in do baptism? Ain't that a beauty? Did you ever hear a guy get up and quote and say, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, mission of sins, you shall see the gift of the Holy Ghost, and forget to tell you that everybody there was an Old Testament Jew? Better watch them. Did you ever hear a fellow come up and say, You got the gift of tongues? No. Well, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And forget to tell you that question was asked to people who'd never been born again and weren't covered by the blood of Christ, and you are? You better know that book. You better, better mess with it. You say, well, I'm not very educated. You don't have to be educated. You just need to read the book. Read the book. Folks, I'm so stupid. Well, all right, okay, praise God, but, but, but get what you can get. And the rapture comes, the Lord will say, come up here, there, stupid. <laughs> you don't have to miss the rapture just because you're stupid. And listen, you don't have to let the devil knock you out of the ring every time you get into it just because you're stupid. Study, 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 search the scriptures. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, and he learned the hard way. The hard way. Folks say, well, what is sin? Well, it's not a sin to be tempted. You know where sin starts? Sin starts in what we call debate. What's debate? Debate is when you begin to turn over in your mind whether or not you're going to do it. Now look at here. You see something that isn't right. There it is. You can't avoid it. There it is. That isn't sin. Uh, you look at that thing, you have knowledge about it. You said, oh, that's wrong. You passed judgment on it. You haven't sinned yet. 
You know where sin enters? Sin enters where you begin to look and then begin to toy in your mind, well, I know what it is, and it's wrong, and should I or should I not? Then you've had it. You've had it. Sin doesn't begin when you do the act. That's very late. The act comes after the thought, and the thought comes after the debate. You notice when Christ is presented with the object of sin, he's presented with the object of sin. That isn't sin. He has full knowledge about them. That isn't sin. But do you notice the difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and you and I? He never debates. Never debates. When the Lord, when he says, cast yourself off this temple, for it is written, Christ doesn't say, now, I'm supposed to do that according to the Old Testament, I've got to do it, the first, second advent, this is the first advent, not the second. But of course, if we did it now, I could also do it later, and uh, uh-uh. He says, it is written, down she comes. No fooling with it. You can't fool with sin, young fella, young lady. You fool with it, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. All right, the next temptation is, let God do it. And if the devil can't get you to leave God out, you know the next thing he'll do? He'll try to get you to sit down and do nothing, let God do all of it. He's subtle. I mean, he says, jump off the temple, Lord, take care of you. Go on, break the speed limit, God will take care of you. You're a Christian. I mean, you're a preacher, you're about the Lord's business, you can drive fast and rest the folks. <laughs> That's what he tells me. That's what he tells you. That's what he tells me. Oh, I let God do it for you. You know, there's people in this world who think that, uh, that God's going to do everything for them. You know what that matches? That matches Eve looking at that fruit there, and she looks at that thing over there, and it's desire to make one wise, the pride of life, to be smart, be outstanding, do something sensational. You know, jump 37 cars with your motorcycle. You know, I mean, be a big shot. God will take care of you. Let God do it. We have the young men and young women come down to school, especially some of the young men, some of the young married men. Some of them come down and after two or three months, I say, you got a job yet? They say, no, we're just living by faith. Uh Uh-uh, uh-uh, you lazy, good for nothing, loafer. Somebody's taking care of you. You talk to your man and say, you call to preach? Father, I'm called to preach. You say, what preparation have you made? Well, I'm going to just open my mouth wide and let God fill it. Like a fellow said, you're full of full of hot air. Did you ever hear these preachers preach and say, "And so, friends, I bless God, I moved the step up on the, on the mountain, and I bless God, He got the Ten Commandments, and I go to God here." You know what that fellow's doing? He's trying to think of something to say. Can't you figure that out? You know, I keep saying, "Ah, ah, ah, ah." He don't have anything there, and he don't have nothing here. He's making it up. No preparation. And so Moses went up and, uh, 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 what's the matter, bud? Haven't you got a message? <laughs> Listen, if you prepared and worked and prayed, you don't have to stutter around like that. You won't find me messing around saying, and so uh, the Lord was uh, up on the Mount of Temptation and uh, uh, the devil came to him and, and uh, uh, the devil, uh, uh-uh. no, we got, we, we can't waste time like that. That Bible says redeem the time. You better make some preparation. You're sure getting quiet. Some of you fellows call to preach. You know, folks say, <laughs> folks say, you know, they say, uh, they say, well, he plays that organ. He should have played that organ fine, you know, and she should have played that piano fine, you know, and I wish I could do that. Get to work. You get a guy learning how to play that organ just sitting around there looking at it? You know, he said, I'm going to give my talent to the Lord. The Lord's going to teach me how to play this organ. He's going to teach you nothing if you sit down and practice. <laughs> fellow said to me one time, he said, where'd you learn how to draw? I said, but drawing? And he said, wasn't a lot of it a talent? I said, yeah, I guess you have to have some. And he said, well, what percent do you suppose it is? And I told him it's 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. That's what it is. I never learned how to draw waiting around for God to make me talented. I learned how to draw. If you look at my notebooks from the time I was 10 years old right now, I've lost track of them. A 30,000 be conservative. It's probably closer to 200,000. You've got to do something. Bob Jones Sr. used to have some great sayings. And I remember one of them was this. He said, God won't do anything for a man that he can do for himself. Now, do you know that's profound? You know, it took me a long time to learn that one. I don't think I learned that until I was in my 40s. Oh, it took me a long time to learn that. I was waiting for God to work a miracle. (laughs) And I'm not saying God can't work miracles. But God won't do something for a fellow that he can do for himself. 
Now listen, if you can make good grades, God will leave it up to you to make them. He ain't going to get them for you. But you know, you know, you can get by just looking at a book once or twice during the week or once or twice during the month, and you just pray and say, Lord, help me pass this exam. Like a little girl prayed in class, she said, Lord, please help Topeka be the capital of North Dakota. <laughs> Because she had it wrong and hadn't studied. Down at our little old night school down there, I make the kids give the grades out loud. You know, I tell them, well, I have a grade. I happen to stand up and give you the grade. I say, you know, what did you make of the test? And the guy stand up and say, 75. Call the next guy's name, 80. Call the guy's name, 90. Call some guy's name, he says, 46. I say, Torres, did you study? Yes, sir. <laughs> Do you really study? Yes, sir. Begins to cry, you know, sometimes. Some of them work at it. Boy, they drive themselves crazy trying to get them Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> and the kid says, I really worked hard, Brother Ruttman. He said, I just couldn't get it. I said, okay, praise God. Don't sit there and say 46. Say 46? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, if you did the best you could, can you do any better? Or if you did the best you could, then God has to do the rest. The couple is folks have a guilty conscience because they didn't do the best. That's the trouble. Now, if you've done your best, praise God. I call out some guy's name and he says, 92. I said, what's the matter with you? He said, 92. I said, bum grade. <laughs> you said, well, 92 is not a bad grade. It is for some folks. Um, some of you fellows could make 98 every time you took a test. Then you have a bad day and make a 95. If a guy can make 98, he's making 92, he's a loafer. Amen, amen, and amen, and amen. And if a guy can't make higher than 50 when he's burning the midnight oil and staying for 12 o'clock, then 50 is a good grade. I mean, the Lord, it's accepted with God according to what a man hath, and not according to what he hath not. All right, this one here is, jump down, God will take care of you, let God do it. Don't you do nothing, let the Lord do all the work. Don't prepare, you let God do the preparation. There are some things you better take care of and you better work at. God won't do anything for a man that he can do for himself. Years ago in this country, there was a little crippled boy that was in terrible condition and a woman named Margaret Sangster, a social worker and a, and a professing Christian, felt very sorry for him and she decided, we're going to fix that boy up and heal him. And it cost thousands of dollars, seven operations, but she went to work and she got some lawyers and bankers and uh, psychiatrists, folks had the money, you know, got them together and finally got that old boy operated on him, got him where he could walk. And she was telling about it, this marvelous success she'd had with this little boy at a woman's club one afternoon. And when she got through, she said that was 15 years ago, and now this young man is 30 years old, and you'll never guess where he is or what he's doing. And they all began to guess. One of them said, is he president of the bank? No. Is he a colonel or a major in the army? No. Is he an educator? No, this and that. And when they got all through, she said, you know where he is? And they said, where? She said, he's in the penitentiary, and if he wasn't of so, such tender age the time he committed this crime, he'd be in the gas chamber. Everybody's face fell, and they wondered what was wrong. And she said, you see, she said, we taught him how to walk. But she said, we forgot to tell him where to walk. See? I mean, some of it you have to do yourself. You have to teach them. You can't just leave all the teaching up to God. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, may God lead you to all truth, but he has evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You don't trust God to take care of you in the situation you had no business going in. Uh, some of you kids recently got victory over some sin. But if you got victory over some sin, then don't hang around that place again. Some of you have trouble with sin. You go by the magazine rack. You know which end they have the magazines on. Stay away from them. Who are you trying to kid? I go down to this country to stop at these air terminals and looking for something to read. Read with me is just like breathing with you. I can't do anything without reading. I read in the bathtub. Read while I'm eating. Read and go to bed at night. Read when I get up in the morning. I read while I'm walking. I develop that habit just like dope, man. Eat, eat up books just like you swallow water. I go to a place to look for some magazines and books to read. Boy, you talk about trash. Mm -mm. Oh, and if you have trouble with that stuff, you know what to go buy and what not to look at. Don't just say, well, I'm a Christian. The Lord will take care of me. <laughs> the devil will knock you out. 
You had trouble with dope before you got right and got cleaned up? You know where the pusher is. Don't go back to it. You know where his friends are. Don't contact them. You know the parties where they pass it out. Don't kid me. You know. Now you know. Now when you get victory over the thing, steer clear. God won't do anything you can do for yourself. See those two feet? They can go this way, or they can go this way, or they can go this way, or they can go this way, and the Lord's going to expect you to use them. I read about a fellow when he was a boy who lived up near Iron Gate Gap, up in the mountains of Virginia. And I've been up in some of those places, like Stone Mountain Gap, some of those places up in the Appalachian Mountains, and they have mountain torrents that come down those streams there at about 25 miles an hour in flood time. Boy, they take everything with them. And there was a place up there called Stone Mountain Gap, where these boys used to cross a swinging bridge to go to church. And they crossed that thing, had to cross it Sunday morning and Sunday night. And this one kid, before he was saved, said it always scared him to death to go across that bridge. Because back in those days, all those preachers preached about hell. Every time he got in the service, the preacher preached about hell, and he knew he was lost and going there. And every time he'd come back home to church Sunday morning, he crossed that bridge, one of the boys would swing on that bridge. Get a swing, there's a rope bridge with slaps in it. He had swinging over that gorge, and he'd tell him, no, wait a minute, no, don't do that. And he'd get scared and back off. They'd call him a coward and call him chicken, but he didn't want to fool with it. And about a week later, one of his friends who was unsaved got out on that bridge and got swinging it when there was a torrential downpour, and that bridge broke, and that boy dropped off in that gorge and washed on down. They picked him up about a half a mile down the place there, stuck in the rocks, down the gorge. And boy, this young fellow had just scared the fire out of him. He got saved the next Sunday. And he said, going back that Sunday, he was feeling so good because he knew he was ready to die and prepared to die. Wouldn't have to worry about going to hell anymore. When he got out on that bridge, he just swung a little bit. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Don't be a swinger. If you were a swinger, don't expect God to hold the bridge up when you shake it. All right, that temptation is, let God do all of it. Now look at the last temptation. Keep on reading. When you come on down there, keep on reading. It says, in the next temptation, the devil showed him all the kingdom of this world a moment of a time. And he said, if you're the son of God. Well, that time he comes, he says to him, he says, you see that? Yes. Well, all those kingdoms are mine, he says in Luke. And I can get into whomsoever I will. And in Matthew, he says, I'll give you all those kingdoms if you'll fall down and worship me. And the Lord said to him, It is written, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord God only, in him shalt thou serve, and quote, put scripture on him again. The last temptation is, if you won't let God do it for you, and if you won't do it yourself, then the devil says, I'll do it for you. That's the last one. That's the strongest one. And the devil won't tempt you to sell out to him till he's tried you on the other two. But if the other two don't work, then the devil will say, well, all right, I'll do something for you. You won't let God do it? Let me do it. And the many a person sold out the devil. Now, I don't know how much uh, uh, some of you kids are fooling around with uh, dope and stuff. Probably not many of you. I hope not many of you. But probably some of you are acquainted with it, or acquainted with people that fool with it. And you know, I'll tell you a strange thing about that business. And a lot of strange things about it. But almost every guy I've ever talked to that got deeply involved with that stuff eventually ran into some pact with the devil. I talked to guys 19, 20, and 21 years old that have told me that I was staring. Well, I know about the devil. I've seen him. I said, well, what kind of conversation took place? He said, he tried to make a deal with me. He said, if you'll sell out, give me your soul, I'll do this and that for you. I've heard from four or five of them. I talked to one kid up in the mental ward of a hospital that lost his eyesight from fooling around with dope, and he was about 18 years old. And I said, that kid, I said, don't you know if you die without Christ, you'll go to hell? He said, well, I'm saved now. I said, good. I said, you know what hell is like, though, what it would be like if you'd have gone? He said, sure, I've seen it. I said, when did you see it? He said, when I was on a trip one time. I said, what's it like? He said, it's a lake of fire. That bird said, it's a lake of fire. I mean, just quoted that thing out, just like he'd read off Revelation chapter 20. Now listen, when you're up against this thing here, the Bible says you're, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God, and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore. A uh, young people, it's a fight. I don't envy you. Some of you are weak. Some of you are stupid. Some of you are inexperienced. You're just starting out life. I, I feel for you. I really do. I feel like a fool standing up here and telling some of you to fight. you got nothing to fight with. you never been in a fight in your life, a real one. Only one that lasted for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But I know God's able. I know God's able to take some of you old skinny runs and fill you with the Holy Spirit of God and make a greater soldier out of, of, of the cross out of you than some of the greatest preachers that ever lived in this country. God chose the base thing of this world and the weak things and the foolish things and the things that are despised. I know God can do it. But something in my, my faith is kind of lacking. And I tell you now to go back in that hell hole you get back into when you leave this camp, get back in that town you live in or wherever it is and get working again, it's going to be a fight. You're going to have to fight. You say, I don't want to fight. You're not going to have any choice. You've got to fight. When you finish, you've got to say what Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. It's going to be a fight. Why, you can't, you cannot win this battle just sitting down looking around and watching a boob tube flick in front of your face. you got to move something. you got to do something. Let me show you what I mean. Here I'm standing here, and I don't have a short wave set, but suppose I had one. And I take a short wave set, and I put this thing over here, and I pick up Berlin, and I put it back here, and pick up Paris. I take that thing, and I put my hand in the aerial. I'm in Brussels, Belgium. I take my hand off the aerial. I'm in New York. Now, you ever something about that? I mean, I'm the conductor. I'm related to the instrument. And what that thing picks up is coming through me and past me and around me. Now, you know something? If I just had a condenser here and a rheostat here and a couple of uh, tubes over here and things and could tune in the right thing, I'd click this here and turn that nose and pop that tongue and tune in. And when those kids talk about getting tuned in and not coming to the right frequency and don't give me that static, they picked up a dope language where the kid's been on the stuff and when he took the trip, he got tuned in. I'm standing here right now do you know that right now there are five color TV programs going right through me? I just can't pick them up. they got TV in Dayton and Cincinnati. Now, I can't pick them up. I've got to quit and pick them up with. But they're coming through me and past me. You know, it's a good thing God didn't make you so you could pick all that stuff up, isn't it? Boy, you'd be a kook, wouldn't you? And what if right now you're picking up the greater beyond, the blue day and the blue horizon and the world tomorrow and young doctor, whatever his name is, and half of this program and some guy getting cut with a knife and a guy rally up in a horse and a train coming down a track and a shortwave signal coming through and a weather forecast all at one time. You know what you'd think? You'd think you'd be an LSD, wouldn't you? You know how those kids fool that stuff? That old brain just tunes it in. It picks up half of this program and a quarter of this one and three-eighths of this one and one-sixteenth of this one and then mixes them. And the kids see these swirls and here's this music and something turns into a toad, up goes a snake, turns into a tree, pops out in the bug, drops off a cliff. You know what he's doing? He's picking up channel 6, 13, 21, and shortwave meter band 5, 10, 11, and AM 15, 1500, and 1300, and FM 6, 7, and 8, and they're all mixed. You want to blow your mind? I'll blow your mind. Now, you know some of that's true, and no doubt in my mind it's true. There is right in this building right now, while I'm talking to you, this gentleman at work, and those spirits are going... I'll say something before it gets out of my mouth. It'll come to you in a different way than it came out of my mouth. You say, that preacher said, and then misquote it. It's a fight. And you get back in that high school you came from, that junior high school, you get down those hallways, man, and then the hallways are just crawling with it. And then locker rooms are just crawling with it. You know what you better learn how to do? You better learn how to fight. You better learn how to say, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Get out that sword and fight. Let the devil do something for you. Listen, the devil can't do anything for you. He's a deceiver. 
He offered Christ all the kingdom of this world in a moment of time, and he could have delivered them, but the Lord wouldn't take them. And every other man the devil ever promised them to, he couldn't give them to. The man couldn't live long enough to get them. You take Alexander the Great, he got off a pretty good hunk of it, but he didn't get all of it. You take Hitler, he got off a pretty good hunk of it, but he didn't get all of it. You take Napoleon, he got a pretty good hunk of it, but not all of it. No man ever got all of it. And listen, listen. If any man got all of it, you know what that Bible says? That Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You ever stop thinking about this? If you could get all of it, and you can't, if you could get all of it, it wouldn't profit you nothing. People are crazy, you know. You ever think, you ever think what you do with a, with a 25 room house with six bedrooms and a 300 acres of land? I mean, except giving it to the Lord, you yourself, what could you do with it? Cornelius Vanderbilt, Billy Mahone, down there, Asheville, Carolina, you ought to see that place. Looks like five Holiday Inns and Ramada Inns put together. I don't know how many bathroom, bedroom that thing got. That guy got that big old thing up there. All they do is walk around, look at one room at a time. You only sleep in one bed at a time, man. You may have 15 bedrooms, but you can't sleep in all of them. <laughs> you just walk around, look at that bedroom, ain't it pretty? And you got to look at that one, ain't it pretty? And you forgot what the first one looked like. Well, if you had all this world, what would you do with it? If you had all of Cincinnati and could run it, what would you do with it except get ulcers from it? That Bible said if a man get the whole world and lose his own soul, it's no profit. The last thing is sell out to the devil, young fellow. You want to be something? Devil sets you up. Devil makes somebody out of you. And he will. I'm convinced after a study of history and a study of biographies of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and perhaps thousands of lives, that every man that got to be a great man in this world, in the, in the eye of this world, had to come to some kind of agreement with the devil. He's called the God of this world. When a man gets up there where all the world is applauding him, somewhere down the line he is sold out. You take those great movie stars and great entertainers, listen, for every guy like Johnny Cash, they're all up and down this country, 5,000 young men beating those guitars in old wooden beer joints and shacks and burning their lungs out on cigarettes and die of TB before they're 30 years old. For every guy like old Mike Jagers gets up there and gets in the chips, there are 5,000 young men winding up in the mental institution and die of the shakes before they're 25 years old. The devil just raised a few of them up, see, and says, look at here, kid, look at here, kid, watch it, kid, look, kid, you can be like this, you can be like this. He can't deliver, he can't deliver, he's a deceiver. You take, we had a fellow back when I was a young man, he was the hero of the heroes. I mean, he put, uh, you know, Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster and that bunch out of business. He was called Errol Flynn. And that old boy, he was the great swashbuckling hero, you know, jumping over the tables and fence, you know, everything. And he was Robin Hood, and he was Captain Blood, and he was, I don't know what all else. He was a big shot. He used to say, in like Flynn, you know, big boy, big man, big time operator, big man with the ladies. All the young fellows I used to run around all in, the arrow Flynn, oh, he's something, boy, be like him. Really? Really? Oh, Errol Finn got making all those movies, Captain Blood and Robin Hood and all this and that. World War II broke out. He went down to the draft board and the draft board wouldn't take him. There wasn't an induction set in the world to take him. He was physically unfit. 4F. Robin Hood. 4F. <coughs> Couldn't even get in a rifle company. Oh boy, got taken to drink, got messed around, got held up in a court for statutory rape, went through two or three marriages and went on, finally got on drugs. That old boy was my age right now, 52 years old. He was a drunken, bloated, bleary-eyed sot. Died in the arms of a 17-year-old girl, and the last letter he wrote to her said, My heart is filled tonight with deep emotions, abysmal thoughts. I want to have you be a fine, decent, honorable young man. My, my, my. They all get conservative after a while, don't they? Errol Flynn couldn't make her into a decent, fine, honorable young man. He couldn't deliver. And the devil can't deliver. Errol Flynn, when he died in his book called My Wicked, Wicked Way, he said, Cheers to mother, damn her too. What a thing for a man to say about his mother. In like Flynn, huh? In hell like Flynn. The world can't deliver. The devil can't deliver. 
I'm here to tell you it's a mirage. It's a mirage. Out there near Saratoga Springs in the Mojave Desert, they found an old miner named Jack Hyatt. And he worked around there for years and should have known better. But his car got stalled there beside the highway on a hot western day, 120 degrees in the shade. And old Jack Hyatt tried to get to the springs and went in the wrong direction. And the people later found Jack Hyatt out there dead in the desert. They followed his tracks for 22 miles. And he was a mile and a half from Saratoga Springs. Went off the wrong way. And the last two miles, they could see his knee prints and his hands. When they found him, he'd crawled up all the cactus and mesquite bushes around there for eight or nine yards, trying to dig water out of that ground. He was deceived. And the devil was a deceiver. He'll say, isn't it wonderful, kid? Don't look great. Boy, hear that. Listen to that. Boy, look at that. Aren't they having a good time, kid? He can't deliver. He can't deliver. Everybody ever tried to sell out to him got tricked. You're no match for him. You take Liz Taylor. I guess she was a big uh, deal here a couple of years back. A lot of the young people, you know, Cleopatra, you know, Richard Burton. Gave her a million dollar ring, something, I don't know, some big old mess. Young lady said, I'd like to be like Liz Taylor. You don't get a lot of attention. No, you wouldn't, kid. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You'd like to have uh, all three of your children by a cesarean section, would you? You'd like to nearly die on the third one? Have hysterectomy and trichotomy and nearly die of pneumonia while you're having it? Slip disc in your back 15 years living off painkillers and pills? You want to live that way, do you? You're a fool. You say, what'd you say? I said, you're a fool. Anybody want to live that way is a fool. Old Liz gets down the end after she's gone through about five husbands. She winds up by saying, I've got Richard and Richard is mine and now I'll have him forever. <laughs> want to bet? <laughs> old Richard Burton was one of the finest Shakespeare actors in the world, second only to Lawrence Olivier. Lost all his power. You know what he is today? He's a bleary-eyed, drunken sot. The devil said, Come on, boy, it's great. Liz Taylor is in the King of Edwards Hotel in Toronto, Canada, room 951. She's in the elevator going up to 951 to rehearse Hamlet, the Shakespearean play. This happened about ten years ago. And three women get in the elevator with her. And one of them introduced herself and said, Honey, would you like to join us for a Bible study? And Liz laughs and says, a Bible study? And they say, yes, we're some women from the Christian group down here, a converted people, and we're having a Bible study in this room. Would you like to join us and study the Bible with us? Liz laughs and goes all up to her room. She ain't laughing now. She ain't laughing now. The devil can't deliver. The devil tell you, just do this. Be like this crowd. You can make it. You can make it. Hold it out to you. He can't deliver. Can't make it. Can't make it. He's a deceiver. Folks are deceived all the time. I guess one of the most horrible stories I've ever read in my life. I read about World War I. And in World War I, a young man got over there with the American Expeditionary Force, went over there early in 1918, and he came back early, he got back his troop ship, got to change around, he got back about a week earlier than he thought he was going to get back, and he told his parents his, where he was coming, but they weren't waiting for him until about a week later. And he got to his home there up in Long Island ahead of time. They didn't know he'd come in. And he got off that ship and got into town with a taxi cab and got up to Long, his Long Island home at night. And when he got to Long Island home at night, his mother and daddy were sound asleep and didn't expect him in, so he thought it would surprise him, so he came in the back door and came in across the kitchen floor, and his daddy woke up and thought it was a burglar and bought a shotgun in there and saw that figure standing in the middle of the, do of the kitchen and blew his son in two with a shotgun. And they turned on the lights and looked at him. There was their boy. Played him over, played him back, dead. Somebody said a mistake. Yeah, you make mistakes. Folks say we all make mistakes. Yeah, you sure can. You sure can. And I'll tell you, if a father can be that deceived about his own son, don't you think that bird there can't finish you off in a trice? You better learn how to put on the whole armor of God and use the sword of the Spirit. Be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And listen, if I'm talking to some unsaved young person in this building here this morning, before lunchtime, you know what you better do? You better get saved. You can be that close to heaven, and that bird talk you right out of it. Slip you right through at the last minute. Down there in Jackson, Mississippi, 
A preacher had a funeral a couple of years back. He was coming home that funeral. It was an icy day, and the roads around Jackson not often icy, but there was ice on them at that time of day, that time of year. And he tried to get by a semi, or the semi got in the wrong lane or something, and he had to get off the road a little bit to get by and hit a slick place there on the side of that road, went off that road, and was killed. And his wife came out there, and came out there with an ambulance unit, an emergency unit, and she knelt with that mangled form out there on that highway, and she began to cry, and she said, Henry, she said, Henry, you are almost home, almost home, darling, almost home. You know something? Some of you kids raised in fundamental churches, had preachers witness to you, had Christian kids have fellowship with you, been to this camp, had guys old bull moose like me skin you alive and call you everything but white and try to wake you up and you're almost home. But you ain't home yet if you're not saved. You're not home, you're safe in the arms of Jesus. You know what you better do? You better move. You better move. You know, Match, I talked to a fellow one time down there in Pensacola after a street meeting where boys were still preaching out the street and I went to a drugstore there and got me a lemonade and some smart out of character came and sat down beside me and he said, well, I guess they'll be coming with a straight jackets in a while, that bunch out there on the street. I said, oh, I don't know. I like to hear a man speak his convictions. At least they believe something. That's more than you can say for a lot of folks these days. And the kid said, well, you don't believe that stuff about hell, do you? Oh, I said, what if it is true? And he said, well, if it's true, he said, when I get down there, he said, I'll stoke the furnace for him." Yeah, you just bet you will. That kid had arms that looked like pipe stands, man. He, he couldn't have, he couldn't have beat a rotten egg, man. Gonna stoke the furnace. <laughs> you know what that kid thought? That kid thought he was a match for the devil. Nobody's a match for the devil but Jesus Christ. An old woman who'd been bedridden for years and years and years had a preacher talk to her one time, and the preacher said, doesn't the devil ever come to you and tempt you? She said, oh my yes. He said, doesn't the devil ever come to you and tell you what a mean, old, nasty, rotten God it is for letting you lie here year after year while the people out hunting and fishing and enjoying life? You just have to lie here bedridden? She said, oh my, yes, he tells me that all the time. And the preacher said, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I'm just interested. I need to know in case I ever get in trouble like this. He said, what do you do when the devil comes around and knocks the door of your heart and starts that stuff? And she said, well, when he comes around and knocks the door of my heart, she says, I just say, okay, Jesus, go see what he wants. <laughs> you let the Lord answer the door. You let the Lord answer the door. Now, you know, I've never preached up here a time that I didn't think about uh, what the years held in the store for you and for me. I see some old friends up here and meet people I've known for years, and I've known some of these preachers now for 15, 20 years. They've seen me in all kinds of trouble and tribulation, and I'll tell you, brother, I've Know what that song means that it says, Through many dangerous toils and snares, I have already come. There's grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will get me home. But you know something? When I look out across these faces, I wonder where you're going to be five years from now, ten years from now. I wonder if you know what a terrible distance there is in one little act, or one little move, or one little failure to resist the devil or one failure to do what God wants you to do. I wonder if you know what's involved. I wonder if I know what's involved. Up there in uh, Chicago, there's a railroad that goes out of Chicago called the Lakeshore Central. And the Lakeshore Central goes out of Chicago to Englewood. And Englewood is about six miles out. And the Lakeshore Central goes right next to the Rock Island Line. I know nobody rides train much these days, so they wouldn't get the significance in it. But those two tracks run right together, coming in the Chicago freight yards, the Lakeshore Central and the Rock Island Line. And when they get to Englewood, which is uh, going out of town about six miles, they begin to park. And then one of those tracks turns off east, that's the New York Central, and it goes on to New York through Pennsylvania and Ohio, and the other one turns west and goes through Omaha, Nebraska, and winds up in Frisco. And you know something? When those two tracks start out of uh, Chicago, a pastor sitting in one seat here, if he picked up his Pullman window and reached out, could shake hands with someone in the opposite track. Those train bodies are about, about that far apart. Train hangs over the track, tracks under the train. And you reach out like this and shake hands with the guy on the track right next to you. And for six miles, those two pastors would be in perfect fellowship. They'd be about four feet apart. 
And then all of a sudden, that thing gets angry with not go like this. And you know something? Three days later, and I don't mean three years, or three centuries, three days later, one of those pastors is in Frisco, the other pastor is in New York. They're separated by over 2,000 miles. Now you know something? You go along there, hand in hand with the Lord, and having fellowship with Him, and you and Him just like that, for six miles, or a hundred, or two hundred. And listen, when that thing comes where it parts, you better get on the right train. Now, I'm not talking about salvation. I mean, you're going to go to heaven. I'm talking about salvation. I'm talking about your fellowship with the Lord. 